this baby was minutes old, and he's saying, that's my boy. My boy is going to do. Isaac Watts, you familiar with Isaac Watts? He was a genius. At the age of four, he learned Latin. At the age of 11, he learned to speak French. Then at the age of 13 years old, he learned to speak Hebrew. I have never been that smart to do anything at a, by the age of 13. That is a lot. He's a, he is a very smart man, right? He started doing poetic reworkings in the Psalms. And they're pretty awesome. But unfortunately, Mr. Isaac Watts was not a very attractive man. And at one glance, there was a lady who came along, and she began to read his poems and thought, well, hey, Isaac Watts, he must be a pretty attractive guy. So she started to fall in love with him, started writing letters to him. They've never met yet face to face. And she started to continue to look at all of his published poems. And Elizabeth was so taken away that she threw caution to the wind. And she asked him to marry her through a letter in the mail. Does anybody else propose that way? (laughs) But here's what happened. So when they finally met, she retracted her offer and took it off the table She later wrote about Isaac Watts, and here is what she said about him. He was only five feet tall. He had a shallow face, a hooked nose, prominent cheekbones, small eyes, and a death-like color. She said, I admired the jewel, but not the casket that contained it. So Isaac was never married, never got married after any of that moment had happened, but he spent his entire life focusing on the glory of God the rest of his life. And in 1719, Isaac Watts published his poetic work based on one psalm that he decided to pick. It was Psalm 98 that would go on to become one of the greatest hymns of all time. The hymn, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Isaac Watts made that song in 1719. Greatest guys of all time, right? And as a kid, to be that parent and to see your kid be so smart, you're thinking, that's my kid, right? In this particular case, that's my boy. I'm really, really proud of him. And you're, you should be ch- very proud of your kids. But have you ever met a parent that ever says, eh, I don't really want my kid to do anything? You ever met a parent that says that? Even parents who have doubts about their kids, deep down on the inside, I firmly believe that they hope that one day their kid wants to do something great. And so today, we are going to look at a father, we're going to look at a song that he produced. His name was Zachariah. And we're going to start back. We've got to go backwards to go forwards. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 5. We're going to learn about who is Zachariah. And then we're going to look into his song. Starting in verse 5, it says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Abijah? See, I don't know Latin. Okay. His wife Elizabeth was, was also a descendant of Aaron, and both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So what do we know about Zechariah? One, he was a priest. He worked in the ministry. Him and his his wife were both in the ministry. Zechariah was also the father of soon-to-be 
John the Baptist, right? So they come from a long line of ministerial backgrounds, Elizabeth and Zechariah. And at this point in time, when they were, when, when this was written, they were both up in age. They were older. We always say age is just a number, but it was a, a larger number than a smaller number. All right? So they were older in age. And all that meant and all the reason we needed to know that was because we needed to understand that at this point in time in their lives, they were not able to have kids. And so at this point in time, we're going to read in just a minute, Zechariah got this privilege. He was going to be able to burn incense in the temple. Now, if you know anything about the temple, the incense was right next to the Holy of Holies place. So this is where the highest of high priests, see, there was a hierarchy of priests that would happen. And he got to burn the incense right outside of the curtain, right outside of the veil where the Holy of Holies, where nobody could really go in and see was at. So what you need to know is at that point in time, that is a very big deal. All right, so he got, just got this privilege. We're going to read about that in just a minute. So jump on down with me to verse 11. We're still in chapter 1. So he's burning his incense, right? He's next to the tower or next to the Holy of Holies. Verse 11 Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of, of incense. Verse 12, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Why was he gripped with fear? Now, when we think of angels, what do you think of? You think of two things, right? This cute little pretty boy who's standing there, very, very nice-like, standing and being awesomely, you know, just, hey, I'm an angel, right? Feathers, all the things. Or you think of the little babies with the diapers, Shooting the arrow? No? Just me? Okay. No, we're talking an angel. So an angel was a warrior. This was a big angel. Seven, eight feet. Big, big, big figure. Comes up to Zechariah. He's just standing there burning incense. And here comes this angel. And he was gripped with fear. He was scared to the bone at this point in time. Verse 13. But then the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or any other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and, excuse me, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. If you were a dad at this point in time, you're going to say, that's my boy, right? He is going to be great, great, great person. But instead, what does Zacharias say? Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now, you got to think about this for a minute. you got to understand where Zechariah comes from. Remember, we, we just read earlier in verse 5 who Zechariah and Elizabeth are. They're old in age. They couldn't bear a child through this entire time. And all of a sudden, this angel, big, big angel, comes up to him and says, Don't be afraid. You're going to bear this kid, this boy, and he is going to, he is going to help nations. He's going to bring all of these people back. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, all of this stuff. Now, you got to remember where they came from, right? They, you you got to think about this from a different perspective. Do any of you have grandkids? Do any of you have great grandkids? Do any of you have great, great, great grandkids? <laughs> do, you all, do any of you have sons and daughters? Are they in your house? 
Okay, so you could technically say maybe that you are well along in years, right? Imagine now, here comes an angel to your door. Don't be afraid, you're going to have a child. You're going to say, what? <laughs> Excuse me? A child? No, not going to happen. I've got great-great-grandkids. I've got great-grandkids. I've got children of my own. I am retired. I am sitting in my recliner. I am done. Amen, right? Amen. <laughs> Those of you who are still in the mix, you're like, we're waiting to say amen, right? This is where Zachariah is right now. You are going to have a child right at this very moment in life. Verse 19. So he doubted. He said, how in the world could this happen? It can't happen. It's impossible. Not going to work, right? Verse 19. The angel said to him, gives him his name. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news of what is going to happen. But verse 20, here's the consequence. And now you will be silent, no longer able to speak until the day that this birth happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. That is what happens when we doubt God. God can do anything that he wants. God is the God Almighty. God is the creator of all things. If God wants to you to have a child, God will give you a child. If God doesn't want you to have a child, you will not receive a child. It is God. It is who he is. He is bigger and all-knowing than all of us. When he says something, you say, okay, or you say, yes. You don't say, huh? Wait, what? You always agree with what God says in your life. So here's what happens. The story goes on. Now we're going to get into the stuff we talked about last week. So Mary visits Elizabeth. This is all during this time. She sings the beautiful song that we read about last week. Uh, Mary sings this song, right? And then during this time, Mary leaves, and then Elizabeth has her baby. And Zachariah still cannot speak at this time. So through the nine months, imagine, guys, you could not speak for nine months. You couldn't even say, yes, dear. You just got to go with it, right? So they ask him this question. They say, uh, the family's all around him. They say, Zachariah, what do you want to name your child? The angel told him what to name him, right? Angel told him what to name him. We are to name him John. So he can't speak. He's looking around. Somebody finds a tablet, not like an iPad, but like an actual brick, you know, and he says, come here, let me write this down. And so he writes down the name, and the name is J-O-H-N, and he shows it to everybody, right? And at that point in time, God releases him. God releases him. He's able to speak. And he begins. He had, you got to remember, he has not spoken for nine months the first words that come out of his mouth are a song. And not just any song. A song about God Almighty. Nine months he waited to say one word. And the first thing that comes out is a song about God Almighty. So Zachariah's song has a name. And it's called the Benedictus. And Benedictus, in Latin, means blessed. And it's taken from the first word in the Latin Vulgate. And so here is Zechariah's song. We're all the way down to verse 67 now, if you're reading with me. Chapter 1, verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied. And here's what he's saying. He said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, 
because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath swore to our father Abraham, the oath to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, now he's talking about John, right? You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet to the path of peace. Zechariah begins by blessing Yahweh for visiting and redeeming his people. And then in verses 76 to 79, Zechariah breaks out in rejoicing over the fact that his child is going to do great things. Have any of you fathers screamed at the top of my, uh, your lungs, that's my boy or that's my girl? Like, I'm so stinking proud of you. I can't believe what you're doing. Like, I'm so overly ecstatic. Zechariah was, this baby was minutes old, and he's saying, that's my boy. My boy is going to do these things. I'm so proud of you. You've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is standing behind him this whole time. Now you've got Zechariah, you've got Elizabeth, both saying, we are so, so proud of you. He breaks out in song over all of this stuff. That's my kid. My kid is going to do all of these things. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for him. And so this song, it's packed with all of these illusions, all of these events that had happened in the Old Testament about the people of Israel. The people of Israel, they had been waiting for the Messiah and had not heard from God in 400 years. So you have to remember, too, at this time that we are at the end of Malachi in the Old Testament. So to us, we turn the page and we go into the New Testament. To them, they, they don't turn the page. They had to wait 400 years for God to say something. And so this, at this point in time, is a big, big deal. This is why Zechariah is so ecstatic, because they have waited so long for God to speak to them, and finally he does. And so in verse 67, Luke, he tells us that Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Only the Spirit could lead him to exp express all of these prophetic thoughts and manner. All of them, all at, the, all at the right time. The presence of the Holy Spirit, it also indicates that the prophecy that Zechariah spoke in the Old Testament was a good one and that it was done. Jesus came to redeem all of humanity and the world has never been the same. So what does this song sing of? What are all of the things that are inside of this? You're going to see a theme through all of these songs because this week is no different than last, than last week. You see, Zechariah's song sings of a saving purpose. He scatters this theme throughout all of the refrain, thrilling at the great purpose of a God to save us. And it comes out in, in four different ways. One of them is that the price to free us is already paid. It's already done. Guys, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live not knowing the end. We already know the end. Eternity, right? 
We know the price has been paid. You see, in verse 68, he says that he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He, God visited us, emphasizing that his care for us has moved him to draw near. And the reason that he comes is to redeem us, which is a rescue at a high price. He has come at extreme cost to himself to free us from the slavery of sin. There is no more sin. Jesus paid it all. Amen? All to him I owe. Right? Another great song. Sin and left the crimson stain. Cleansed us white as snow. The price has already been paid. Here's the second thing it talks about. It talks about the power to accomplish our salvation is his. And here's what I mean by that. So in verse 69, it talks about how he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Now, the horn in Scripture, it's a symbol. It's an animal symbol, and it's a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of power. And so to say that God has raised up a horn of salvation for us means that we have a God, we have a mighty Savior who has the power to finish what he starts for us. The third thing that he talks about in, in, in this particular part about being saved is that the victory over our enemies is assured. Verse 71, here's what Zacharias says. He says, he raised, he has raised up salvation from our enemies and from the clutches of those who hate us. Zacharias' focus is practical and it's spiritual. God will deliver his people from anybody, but more importantly, God will deliver us from our worst enemies. What is the worst enemy in our lives today? Sin. And God said right there in Zechariah's prophetic song, I will raise you up from sin. I will deliver you. I will rescue you. I will take it away. All of the sin. And here's the fourth thing about his saving grace. The erasing of all of the offenses is certain. All of our offenses will be washed away. Verse 77 to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Zechariah is telling us that God did not visit this planet to just see how we're doing. He didn't just come to say hi. He knew how we were doing. He knew what was going on. That's why he came. And he says, I'm going to take all of it and I'm going to wipe it away. You see, that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? What else does he sing about? He sings about the predicted fulfillment. He can't stop glory, glorying in God. And, and all that he said he would do, he has begun to accomplish. So Zechariah, he emphasizes that what God was doing fulfilled what he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times, that God was remembering his holy covenant, that he swore to our father Abraham. He was going back into the Old Testament saying, here is what, where it is, and here is where we are now. Zechariah is telling us something that makes God distinct from all of the other people. He establishes lordship over time for us by binding himself to promises that the passing of time in no way dims. Someone counted, and there are no less than 456 prearranged signs in the Old Testament to properly identify the Messiah. 456 signs that Jesus was to come. the one and only Son of the living God, Jesus Christ. And God does what he says in his time, on his way, for his glory, for our good. Not on our time, not for our glory, not for our name, for only the glory of God. Third thing, he, he also sings of a transforming enablement. 
Zechariah tells us that this Messiah, what this Messiah is to bring those who trust and follow him. There's going to be a spiritual transformation that's going to happen inside of us. Verse 74, it says to serve him. And then there will be an, an emotional transformation in verse 74, which says that we are to serve him without fear. And then there will be a behavioral transformation in verse 75, which says in holiness and righteousness in his presence all of our days. God never leaves us alone. We talked about that last week, right? It's going to be a theme. You're going to hear me say it time and time again. God never leaves us. He never leaves us the way that we are. If we listen to God, God will respond. God will answer. God will change. You see, so many people, they live lives of quiet desperation. They just keep running, running, wondering, what's the difference? What does it matter? What's the purpose of life? Why do I keep doing what I'm doing over and over and over again? But an old priest in Zechariah, he sees the end to all that is, that is in God's deliverer. I found this online. I'm, I'm going to read you the different things that, that God says. He says, He came so that we who were lost in sin might be lifted up into the service of God. He came so that we who served another master might serve God our creator. He came so that we who fear facing God might be reconciled to him. He, he came so that we who felt the disconnection of our lives from all purpose might have life abundantly. He came so that we who once could not please God might be pleasing to him forever. He came so that we who were unholy might have our lives aligned to him and his ways. It's a transformation process. Romans chapter 12, right? Don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We must change the way we are to see the glory of God. And here's the fourth thing he sings about in this song. He sings about an unmatched impact. Zechariah's solo, it closes with a final burst of praise about light. And on Christmas Eve, every Christmas Eve, we light our candles. We light a Christmas tree. We light these cool things. I think they're called patio lights, right? We light... We light the garland around the room. We turn these lights on so that we could see. Light is a very important part of who we are in God. Jesus is our light. He is the light of the world. You know, it's interesting, the difference between light and darkness. And I want to tell you a story. I'm going to get a little serious, okay? So... When I get up in the morning to come here to church, I am normally the first one awake. In fact, I am the first one awake. And I try not to wake anybody up, so I say that I'm always quiet as a mouse. Well, if it's really dark in my room, we have a pretty tiny room, it's narrow. And I go over and I'm getting my clothes ready to go and I turn the corner to go around my bed, and sometimes I hit that corner. That corner of the bed, you know? And sometimes you hit it here, and sometimes you kick it with your foot, and then the quiet room no longer becomes quiet. <laughs> it can tend to become loud. It's because it's darkness surrounding me. I can't see. I don't know what's going on around me. I, 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 I could feel things. I could try and move things, but then I bump into a chair or I might knock over something on my dresser, which I've done a hundred times. But you just can't see in the dark, can you? There's a lot of things that can happen in the dark that you just can't overcome, right? You have to have something to be able to see where you are. Jesus Christ is that light. Jesus Christ is the light in our lives. He illuminates everything. He is our light in the dark world. And so the nation of Israel, they felt like they were in a dark place in the Old Testament. After all of the battles, after all of this stuff, they did all of this stuff. The Israelites did so many things for God. And then all of a sudden, God cut them off. 
for 400 years. And you know what they probably thought? We're in the darkness. Where are you, God? What, what's happening? And so they've been sitting in this darkness for so many, time, so many years, 400 years. All of a sudden, God comes back into the picture, and we hear that Zechariah is going to have a son, and his name is John. And, and so Zechariah can't help but sing about all of these different things. Salvation is going to be coming. Light is going to be here. The world will no longer be the same because we, we see God's forgiveness, his mercy, and his faithfulness through all of this stuff. And the light of the world will be here and illuminate everything. That is why he sang. That is the reason for Christmas. And I am so very grateful that we get to sing so many wonderful songs like joy to the world. And O come, O come, Emmanuel. What a great song of praise that we get to shout. Let's not forget the reason for the season. All right? Let's pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we, we are so very grateful that you have brought your son into this world to light it up and sometimes, Father, we might feel like we're in this dark place, like we don't know where we're headed. We might bang in and stumble over things at times, but, Father, when you are here, you shine so bright that we can realize how forgiven we really are. And so I pray, Father, that we can continue to come to you, that we can continue to reconcile our sins to you, that we can bring all of the burdens, all of the mess, all of the chaos that happens in our lives on a daily basis and share it with you so that we can feel and have that redemption with you. You know, Father, I always think that you're always up there cheering us on. That you're always saying, that's my boy. Or, Father, or you're saying, that's my girl. That you're just shouting it from the rooftops, just waiting for us to hear it. I pray, Father, that we can show that excitement and that love to the people around us, to our community, Father, that they might be able to hear and see and feel the warmth that you offer each and every day. I want to thank you for your son that you gave so that we could have this redemption. And it's in your name that we pray all of these things. Amen.